Hi everyone, it's really great to be here at DevOps Loop. Today we're going to be talking about blaming DevOps, shifting left the wrong way. My name is Hannah Foxwell. And I'm Andy Bergen. We've been doing the DevOps thing for a while now and we've learned a few lessons along the way. Today we'd like to share a few of those with you. In 2010, we set off to solve this problem with DevOps, the wall of confusion as it came to be known. On the left, we have dev teams that focus on features, and on the right, we have ops teams focusing on stability. Immediately, we've got an alignment problem here. Change all the things versus change none of the things. Devs would release software, throwing it over the wall, typically without warning to the ops team. They were expected to drop everything and get it running. A world of poor handoffs, terrible feedback, and a miserable experience for all involved. Yeah, it genuinely was a miserable experience. In 2010, I was working as a release manager for a retailer here in the UK. So I was literally sat on top of this wall of confusion with my spreadsheets and my checklists, trying desperately to get the people in dev and ops to talk to each other. It was a really hard job. And that experience of how painful it was to ship software into production is why I took an interest in DevOps in the beginning. But the DevOps problem of 2010 was at a point in time. Since then, we've embraced new tools, platforms, and engineering practices. We've built these amazing communities and foundations. We've learned from each other and from some visionary leaders along the way. But before DevOps was called DevOps, the problem we were trying to solve had already been identified, and it remains the same today. How do we deliver software rapidly, safely, and securely into the hands of our users? But even before all that, in 2006, at Amazon, this was the narrative coming from their then CTO. You build it, you run it, which is a great idea when you think about it. Who better to work on software than the developers that made it? They have the domain knowledge about how it works. They know if it's functioning correctly, if it's performing correctly. And most importantly, they know how to fix it if it breaks. So if we move forward to today, Development teams are more than just a bunch of devs. They include many different roles, many different skills, creating cross-functional teams to deliver modern software. So combining you build it, you run it, and all the subsequent DevOps goodness, we've created this idea of shifting left, which solves lots of problems. Shifting left is a great idea, but have we thrown too much left? We know that teams who have autonomy and ownership are more productive, happier and healthier, but is there a tipping point? How much responsibility is realistic for a team to take on? Is the domain knowledge and complexity that we introduced by this ownership simply too much? And shouldn't building apps be their priority? A recent report by Haystack Analytics found that 83% of developers report suffering from burnout. And that's not okay, 83%. You build it, you run, it still feels like the right approach, but how can we do it without burning out our development teams? How can we prioritize effectively when we have so many problems to solve? Indeed, and I've seen several times through my career, tasks being shifted left, only for them to sink to the bottom of the backlog because there are more important things to be done. So to shift left successfully, we need a different approach to how we build and run our systems. Since 2018, I've been part of a platform engineering team, first at Pivotal and now at VMware Tanzu. So I meet loads of teams and organizations who are wrestling with these same problems, and I try and help them. The State of DevOps report last year picked up on two key patterns for success that I've also seen work in the real world, product mindset and self-service. As a platform team, your developers are your users. We need to understand their needs and make it easy for them to do the right thing. But it's easy to sometimes default to the old ways of thinking and the old ways of working, even when we're trying to do something new. We take a project approach and disband the team as soon as a minimum viable platform is in place. Or we build a platform in a vacuum, never asking our users what they need from us, resulting in over-engineering or launching a product that's simply not fit for purpose. We try and solve all of our problems for everyone and do a big design architecture up front and we get bogged down in analysis paralysis instead of iterating through a build, measure, learn cycle, delivering value as early as possible. And of course, we often route requests through ticketing systems and humans instead of surfacing those capabilities through an API or adopting a self-service model. 
When we adopt a product mindset and a user-centric approach to building platforms, we can have a huge impact on developer productivity. We abstract away a lot of that complexity that we just talked about so they can focus on building apps for their users. We can use developer experience practices to further make our platform a compelling proposition for developers. Here's a quote from Matthew Skelton, the man you pace, the authors of Team Topology's book. A platform is a curated experience. And developer experience is something I've been doing at Skybound and Gaming for the last three years. So Skybound and Gaming is a UK-based online bookmakers, providing sports betting across a plethora of sports and a portfolio of online gaming products such as poker, bingo and casino, and many, many more. I work for the platform squad that run the Kubernetes cluster at Skybetting and Gaming. My role changed a few years ago when I was asked to head up the newly formed developer experience team to address some of the growing pains that we were experiencing with the rapidly increasing number of users and workloads on the cluster. So we started small with some experiments. You might say a minimal viable experience, but we went on to identify and speak to the development teams that were using our cluster, sharing updates, collecting feedback, and providing training where necessary. We then, in the next year, collaborated with the development teams to define what good looks like and build tools to, to support them to make that happen. And more recently, we've increased our focus on optimization, and we're also looking at ways to expand the role of developer experience across our parent tribe. Let me give you a specific example. So something that before developer experience may have been shifted left and sunk down the backlog order of priorities for something more important, Let's talk about compliance reporting. So we took a two-step approach to this. In the first step, we collaboratively agreed with the development teams around the business to create standards about how we build, run, and deploy containerized workloads. We got everybody's involvement in that. We got it signed off and versioned as an official document. The second step is to build things to enable and empower developers to do the right thing. That could be docs, could be a dashboard, could be training, Whatever it is, in this case, we codified some of those standards and rules that have been identified and then create a dashboard to visualize compliance for the user's workloads. So they could quickly see if their workloads were compliant with the standards that they helped write. Plus, we provided links through to documentation about how to resolve any issues which were highlighted. You can think of it kind of like code validation, but for your running workloads. I love the user-centric approach that Andy and the team at Skybet have taken on their platform journey. And this user-centric approach can be applied to everything we do, including day two operations and reliability. A couple of years ago, I was helping a Pivotal customer get started with SRE practices, things like SLIs, SLOs, and error budgets. We spent a week together with their platform team and development teams, those, those teams who were early adopters of the platform. Ultimately, we all understood that the platform needed to help the app teams achieve their SLOs of availability and performance in production. That was simple. But we also set ourselves some service level objectives around developer experience. We talked to the dev team about what they needed from the platform to be happy and productive. This resulted in setting SLIs and SLOs around their ability to deploy apps and the availability of pre-production to run their test suites. Taking shared ownership for reliability and taking an interest in the user experience in pre-production really helped us to break down those silos between the platform and the development teams. And over the past decade, we've learned a lot. Too much to share in this short talk, but these simple lessons are a great place to start. Speak to your users and solve their problems. Build tools and platforms that people actually want to use, and you'll be DevOpsing before you know it. By engaging, empowering, and supporting your developers, you're creating a de developer experience to make those platforms compelling. Building platforms is often fun, but we don't just build platforms for fun. We always need to ask ourselves why and build solutions that work for our users, but also the organizations that we work within. Thinking back to 2010 and the pain we all felt trying to bridge the divide between dev and ops, I can see that we've come a long, long way but for most teams, this isn't a solved problem. We're all still here to learn, share, and get better at this together. We can't just shift left and hope for the best. To get this right, we need platforms that deliver value by easing the path to production, but also looking after people along the way. DevOps covers so many topics and practices. What matters is how you apply those principles to address your situation. So do we blame DevOps for shifting left? 
I think we probably do. And if done right, that can be a wonderful thing. Thanks, folks. Uh, we're going to be hanging out in the Slack to answer any of your questions. And of course, we'll be taking part in the panel sessions later. Yeah, so drop us a message if you want to uh, pick our brains on anything we covered today. But thanks for having us. It's been great. Thank you.